Okay, so we left off with uh, neuron physiology here. Uh, as I mentioned, neurons are highly irritable. Uh, they will respond to adequate stimulus by generating action potentials, which is a nerve impulse, the actual depolarization of the membrane, that's the traveling of the signal. Uh, when we talk about action potentials, the impulse is always the same regardless of the stimulus. There are no strong action potentials, there are no weak action potentials, they're just action potentials. So some principles of electricity, uh, opposite of charges are going to attract each other. Energy is required to separate opposite charges across the membrane, and energy will be liberated when the charges move towards one another. If you have opposite charges that are separated, this creates a potential energy. Um, and any reversal of that system could actually be what we refer to as a change uh, in a depolarization state, which is essentially the actual signal, the flow of ions. So voltage, this is the measure of potential energy that's generated by a separated charge. And we know that resting membrane potential has a voltage of minus 70 millivolts. Could be off, you know, by five or 10 but typically it's minus 70 millivolts. The potential difference, this is the voltage measured between two points and the current would end up being the flow of electrical ions between those two points. Now, membrane channels play a very important role here. Proteins serve as membrane ion channels. And there are two types of ion channels that exist. We have leakage or non-gated channels. These are always open. Then you have your gated channels, and we saw some of these with the skeletal muscle physiology. Chemically gated channels, these are ligand gated, okay, which means they open and close by the binding of a specific neurotransmitter. Voltage gated channels, on the other hand, these will open and close in response to changes in the actual membrane potential. Mechanically gated channels, these will open and close in response to physical deformation of the actual receptors. When gated channels are open, um, ions will diffuse quickly across the membrane along what's called electrochemical gradients, meaning you have a charge, but you also have the chemical part, which is the actual ion. Along the chemical concentration gradients, <coughs> they will travel from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Along an electrical gradient, they will travel towards the opposite electrical charge. So if you have a bunch of positive sodium ions on the outside, they're gonna to travel towards the inside, which is negatively charged. Plus don't forget you have a disproportion of sodium on the outside than you do on the inside. The ion flow caused by the opening of the gated channels will create an electrical current and voltage changes will occur across the membrane. Now the potential difference across the membrane of a resting cell is referred to as resting membrane potential. As I said, it's approximately about negative 70 millivolts. And what you end up seeing on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane is negatively charged relative to the actual outside of the membrane. This difference is generated by ionic makeups of intracellular and extracellular fluids, meaning you have differences in ions that are found in the inside versus the outside as well as the differential permeability of the plasma membrane. Intracellular fluid has a lower concentration of sodium and chloride than does extracellular fluid. Intracellular fluid has a higher concentration of potassium and negatively charged proteins, which are anions that affect extracellular fluid. Remember, on the inside of the cell, you're gonna have a lot of proteins present there. So that's actually gonna help contribute to part of the negativity on the inside. The differential permeability of a membrane is impermeable to the anions. Proteins can't go through. It's slightly permeable to sodium through leakage channels. It is 75 times more permeable to potassium, meaning that you're gonna have more leakage channels for potassium. And chloride ions are freely permeable. The negative interior of the cell is due much, is 
due to much greater diffusion of potassium, which is positively charged, out of the cell than sodium diffusion into the cell. And something that helps to maintain resting membrane potential is something called the sodium potassium pump. And this helps to maintain those differences on either side. Because you have these leakage channels, you're always pumping sodium ions back out. Okay, so think of a sump pump. You know, water is going to want to flow into the lowest part of the house, which would be the basement. As that starts to flow in, people don't want water in their basement, so they have a sump pump, which will um, pump it back out. Now, that does cost energy, and a sodium potassium pump to maintain resting membrane potential does cost energy. Now, the membrane potential will change when concentration of ions across the membrane change. The permeability of the membrane to the ion changes could also be a cause for membrane potential change. Changes in membrane potential are signals used to receive, integrate, and send information along the central nervous system. And as we saw, even with the uh, muscles. Now there are two types of signals. There's what we have graded potentials. These are incoming short distance signals. You are, these are dependent on the strength of the signal. And then you have action potentials. These are long distance signals down the axons. And there are no strong or weak uh, action potentials. The change in the membrane potential, which would be a depolarization state, is a reduction in membrane potential towards zero. Inside the membrane becomes less negative than resting membrane potential, and this increases the probability of producing a nerve impulse, meaning you might hit that point at which all the voltage-gated channels open, and you get a complete reversal of membrane potential, which would be the signal. So if resting membrane potential is at negative 70 millivolts, and we see a little depolarization event here due to a stimulus, we could see that it becomes less negative, okay? Hyperpolarization would be the opposite. This is where something becomes more negative. Graded potentials, as I said, these are short-lived localized changes in the membrane potential. These are depolarizations or hyperpolarizations, and it really depends on the stimulus. Graded potentials will occur when a stimulus causes a gated ion channel to open. And this is typically what we see when you really say something like acetylcholine. The more acetylcholine you release, the more gated ion channels you open, the stronger the signal, okay? What can happen is graded potentials can eventually get you to what we call as threshold. Threshold is the point at which now voltage gated channels open, and that's usually when you would trigger an action potential. Now the difference between action potentials and graded potentials is that an action potential is a brief reversal of membrane potential with a total amplitude of 100 millivolts. This occurs in muscle cells, but also occurs in the axons of neurons. It does not decrease in magnitude over distance, and it is also the principal means of long distance neural communication. And there are four main steps to an action potential. You know, we're at resting state, we then go through a depolarization state. Part of that depolarization state is you're going from minus 70, and then eventually, because of the release of chemicals and binding to ligand-gated channels, you get a little bit of depolarization. But once you hit threshold here, which is indicated here by minus 55, that then opens voltage-gated channels. As those voltage-gated channels open, you get a complete reversal of membrane potential where you shoot all the way up. Plus 30, those sodium channels close, potassium channels open, and you start to repolarize. Repolarization is bringing you back down. So during resting state, only leakage channels for sodium and potassium are open. All gated sodium and potassium channels are closed. During a depolarization phase, depolarizing local currents open voltage-gated sodium channels. Sodium influx causes more depolarization, and at threshold, Positive feedback leads to opening of all sodium channels and a reversal of membrane potential to a polarity of plus 30. This is your spike of the action potential. As you start to repolarize, sodium channels will start to close. The membrane permeability to sodium declines to resting levels. Slow voltage-gated gates stay open. Potassium exits the cell and the internal negativity is restored. The hyperpolarization state is some potassium channels remain open. This allows for excess potassium efflux.
This will cause an after hyperpolarization of the membrane, or we call as an undershoot. Now at threshold, it's important to realize what's happening. The membrane is depolarized by about 15 to 20 millivolts. Sodium permeability increases. The sodium influx exceeds potassium efflux. And positive uh, feedback cycle begins, okay, which is really going to sort of trigger the entire event uh, moving forward. If you end up with a sub-threshold stimulus, what that means is this is weak depolarization. It does not reach threshold. You will not fire an action potential. You must, must hit threshold. Threshold stimulus is one enough to trigger, strong enough to trigger that action potential. Okay. Um, an action potential is going to be an all or none phenomenon. Action potentials will either happen or they will not happen, okay? Uh, there is no start and stop midway through here. If it's going to go, it's going to happen. So it's a phenomenon. All action potentials are alike and are independent of the stimulus intensity. So how do you distinguish in the central nervous system between a weak and a strong stimulus? And the way that that happens is not by the intensity of the action potential, as you can see here. We see in the purple line on the bottom graph, this is the stimulus and the intensity of the stimulus. You can see we have a sub-threshold one, there's no action potentials. You can see we have a threshold stimulus where it does cross threshold and we produce four action potentials. And then you can see we have a stronger stimulus and the way that that comes across in the central nervous system is not by the intensity of the action potential, but rather by how many action potentials are being fired within a period of time. And that's really what's establishing how intense of a signal you have, is not by the intensity of the action potential, but rather the number of action potentials that occur. During this whole period, we will, you will also run into what they call an absolute refractory period. This is the time from the opening of the sodium channels until the resetting of the channels. This ensures that each action potential is an all or none event. It enforces one-way transmission of nerve impulses, uh, and you must come back to resting membrane potential if you want to start another action potential, okay? Now, I also wanna point out something here and that an action potential takes in total about four milliseconds. Four milliseconds is each millisecond is one one thousandth of a second. So picture these signals going back and forth from say your periphery to the brain, from the brain back down to the periphery. This is all happening instantaneously and in within milliseconds. The relative refractory period, this follows an absolute refractory period. Most sodium channels have returned to their resting state. Some sodium, potassium channels are still open. Repolarization is occurring. The threshold for action potential generation is elevated. Exceptionally strong stimulus may actually generate an action potential during this period. Okay, um, so some things to take into consideration as far as the, the, the transmission of the uh, action potential. And that would be the actual diameter of the axon, but also the effect of myelination. myelination. The myelin sheaths, these will insulate and prevent leakage of charge. Saltatory conduction, which I mentioned in the prior recording, uh, in myelinated axons is about 30 times faster. Voltage-gated sodium channels are located at the nodes and action potentials appear to jump rapidly from node to node. And what we see here is, you can see this is a myelinated axon here, okay, or an unmyelinated axon. You see how you have to depolarize here, and then you gotta depolarize here, and here, and here, and here. And that takes a lot longer versus if you had a myelinated axon where you would depolarize here, then it would jump to here, then it would jump to here. So you're jumping along, and that whole jumping mechanism is referred to as saltatory conduction. Um, 
as you're looking over the whole action potential and the transmission, please look at the review sheet that I have up there. Uh, the same thing that you, it's the same review sheet that we have for the muscle cell physiology. And on that review sheet, I sort of indicate what channels are opening and closing during the various phases of the action potential. Uh, so just look over that review sheet. So let's talk about the synapse. Uh, the synapse is a junction that mediates information transfer from one neuron either to another neuron or from one neuron to an effector cell. And again, the effector cell could be a muscle or it could be a um, it could be a muscle cell or it could be um, a uh, gland. Sorry. A presynaptic neuron, this is one that conducts impulses toward the synapse, and a postsynaptic neuron would be transmitting impulses away from the synapse. Okay, so here's a synapse could be, you know, you can have what we call an axodendritic mm -hmm. synapse. This is from, you know, the axon of one neuron and the dendrites of another. You can have axon somatic, axon axonic. So there's different types of connection points, okay? The electrical synapses are a lot less common. Your most common synapse is gonna be that of a chemical synapse. This is what we saw with the um, skeletal muscles and the release of acetylcholine. Typically, there's two parts to the chemical synapse. You have the axonal terminal of the presynaptic neuron, which will contain synaptic vesicles and release neurotransmitter. Then you have the receptor region on the postsynaptic neuron. The synaptic cleft, this is the fluid-filled space separating the pre- and postsynaptic neurons. This prevents nerve impulses from directly passing from one neuron to the next. In order for you to get to signal, say, on a second neuron in the path here, you actually have to bind neurotransmitter, you have to generate enough stimulus to hit action, hit threshold, and that will then fire the action potential. Transmission across the synaptic cleft is a chemical event it's opposed to an electrical one. It involves the release, diffusion, and binding of neurotransmitters, and this helps to ensure unidirectional communication between neurons. As the action potential arrives at the axonal terminal, the presynaptic neuron, and opens voltage-gated calcium channels, what happens is the calcium uh, will promote the fusion of the synaptic vesicles within the axonal membrane, and essentially, the calcium is going to initiate exocytosis, which is the, uh, you know, uh, removal of the vesicle out into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitter will then diffuse and bind to the receptors, often chemically gated ion channels on either the postsynaptic neuron, or it could also be the skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle or smooth muscle or some type of gland you know, some type of effector organ. The ion channels are open. This will cause excitatory inhibitory events, which is a graded potential, which then may eventually lead to an action potential. And this little diagram right here sort of goes over what I have drawn on that review sheet. And just make sure you know the events, you know, happening here where you cut the action potential comes down, you get an influx of sodium, that influx of sodium causes the vesicles to undergo exocytosis where you release the neurotransmitter, these bind to chemically gated channels, which then open and you get somewhat depolarization. If there's a strong enough signal there, the depolarization hits threshold, in which case then you fire an action potential. Because, uh, and the firing of the action potential because all the voltage gated channels have now opened. Okay. Now, um, once the neurotransmitter has been released, there's a few things that will happen. Some of it will just diffuse out of the range. The other part is that the neurotransmitter most likely will be degraded by enzymatic activity. This is so you don't get a prolonged effect of signaling, okay? So almost immediately after it's discharged by exocytosis from the axonal terminal, it will be degraded by enzymes. And that's any neurotransmitter that has not bound to a chemically gated channel. Uh, if you want continued signaling, okay, what has to happen is another action potential has to come down, causing depolarization and release of action, uh, neurotransmitter from the um, 
axonal terminals and you know the whole process repeats itself. Okay. So termination of neurotransmitter effects, this occurs within a few milliseconds. The neurotransmitter effect is terminated by degradation of enzymes, reuptake by astrocytes or axonal terminals, and or diffusion away from the synaptic cleft. The synaptic delay is a phenomenon in which neurotransmitter must be released and diffused across the synapse, and it must then bind to receptors. The synaptic delay, this is the time needed to do this, and typically it's anywhere from 0.3 to 5 milliseconds. The synaptic delay is the rate limiting step of neurotransmission. Neurotransmitters, uh, you know, the next few slides will go over different families of neurotransmitters. Uh, and you guys can sort of look through these. These are just more definition type things. Uh, there are over 50 different families of neurotransmitters that have been identified. They are classified by their chemical structure and function. The one neurotransmitter that I do want you guys to be aware of is acetylcholine. And we have seen acetylcholine before. We saw it with the skeletal muscle. This is released at the neuromuscular junctions and, and some autonomic nervous system neurons. So we'll see it again when we get into the autonomic nervous system. It is synthesized by enzyme choline acetyltransferase, and it's degraded by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. Okay. And that is it for nervous tissue. Okay, and like I said, we will talk about this this week during our sessions. Have a good day, guys.